Now, at the end of this presentation, your attention is going to be greatly improved if you follow what I'm going to show you. There's no doubt that we have a major problem with attention, as well as the hyperactivity that can be connected to it. So I want to discuss this condition, but just be rest assured, there is a very simple solution that has very minimal, if any, side effects. And I think the only problem that people will have is how do you come off your medication with the help of your doctor, of course, and uh, how do you make that transition? Well, you're just going to have to do it gradually with supervision so you could eventually come off. But the diagnosis using the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is a little bit outdated, but it's almost the same as how they diagnose it now. It's just becoming a big problem because you get a label and a prescription, okay? And then what is the long-term effect? Do you eventually come off this medication? What are the side effects when you come off? Is it addictive? These are all things that um, are not worked out. Now, living in an environment with sensory overload, you know, mainly this thing right here, every five seconds you're getting text messages. So our society is training us to have less and less attention units with all the different stimuli that are around us. So it's how do we get more attention? How do we get more done? I want to discuss that. But let me first entertain you by um, going through how they diagnose this. It's completely arbitrary. It's, there's no blood tests. It's all subjective. Um, here we go. The tension deficit disorder, hyperactivity disorder. There's two sections, one for inattention and the other is for hyperactivity. I'm going to go through both. So if you have six or more of these, um, you're diagnosed, often fails to give close attention to detail or makes careless mistakes. Okay, I could think I have that. Uh, B, often has difficulty sustaining attention in task or playing activities. Okay. C, often does not seem to listen when spoken to directly. All right, next one, often does not follow through on instructions and fails to finish schoolwork, chores, duties in the workplace. Which one of you have that one? All right, next one, often has difficulty organizing tasks and activities. Now, for me, this is why I hire people to do that part, because generally I am not very organized. All right, next one, often avoids dislikes or is reluctant to engage in tasks that require sustained mental effort, such as schoolwork or homework. Next one, often loses things necessary for tasks or activities, toys, school assignments, pencils, books, tools, you know, your dog ate your homework, right? Which is a legitimate excuse. All right, next one is often easily distracted by extraneous stimuli, okay? It's often forgetful in daily activities. I mean, who does not have virtually all of these? Now, the next one involves hyperactivity, often fidgets with hands or feet or squirms in seat. I do that all day long. Often leaves seat in classroom or in other situations. Often runs about or climbs successfully in situations. What if the person has a lot of energy? Next one, often has difficulty playing or engaging in leisure activities quietly. I guess if we play, we need to be quiet when we're playing. I mean, that is ridiculous. Next one uh, is often on the go and often acts as if driven by a motor. Wow, that's interesting. Often talks excessively. So in other words, we should play quietly. Don't talk too much. Don't seem to have too much energy. Make sure you don't climb on anything. Now, I just have to just uh, show you two other things that are, um, you know, if you want to be entertained today from this book. Um, page uh, 736, it says, um, adverse effects of medication not otherwise specified and I guess the code is 995.2. This category is available for optional use by clinicians to code side effects of medication when these adverse effects become the main focus of attention. So if I understand this correctly, if the patient focuses too much on the adverse effects, then we can throw this code in there. Now, look at this other one right here. Uh, this diagnosis is uh, V15-81, noncompliance with treatment. Okay. The reasons for noncompliance may include discomfort resulting from treatment, you know, like side effects, expense of treatment, decisions based on personal value judgments or religious or cultural beliefs about the advantages and disadvantages of proposed treatment. All right. So whether you're diagnosed or not, and you want to increase your attention, 
your attention span, um, realize that um, ADD or ADHD has nothing to do with someone's intelligence, okay? We're talking about attention, a lack of attention and hyperactivity in some cases. Intelligence is something completely different. There are people that are not intelligent that have this, but it's very difficult to even find the definition of intelligence. If you try to look it up, uh, I guess uh, the medical professionals just don't agree on what it is. Some people were related to the grades you get in school or how well you memorize things. Well, to me, that's not necessarily intelligence. I mean, intelligent people might be able to memorize very well, but people that can't memorize are also intelligent. So I think if we want to define intelligence, we have to look at the opposite of intelligence, which is stupidity. Okay. What is that? That's lack of reasoning, lack of knowledge, unawareness, lack of judgment. And so intelligence must have logic, rationality, reason, the ability to think, the ability to solve problems, and the ability to quickly pick things up and understand them. But someone's learning ability can also be affected by just not having um, the right teacher that can teach you the basics in school. Now, I know for me in school, I had a really good teacher in chemistry in high school that really taught us the basics, right? So those basics allowed me to go to the next level and learn more and more about chemistry. Yet in other subjects, I didn't learn these basics. So it was very difficult to learn things over this missing foundation. Like right now, I'm studying genetics. I'm interested in DNA. And um, a lot of the information the courses assume you remember all the basics. And I literally had to find videos of teaching um, genetics to kids to really wrap my wits around these basic pieces. And this brings up a very important point. If a child is in school and they're not really taught these basics and they're trying to learn high level things, you talk about confusion and a lack of attention because you had no foundation. So everything is a confusion. So unfortunately, I think a lot of kids are just um, diagnosed with this disorder when in fact, what they really need is better study skills. They need to learn how to learn. Now, there is a physical component to this, okay, in your brain. Um, they don't know this for sure, but there's some relationship between the frontal cortex and your ability to concentrate. There's also a relationship between another part of the brain called the hippocampus and your ability to focus and concentrate, which is in the category of cognitive functions. Now, what's interesting about the brain is it's only 2% of your body weight, but takes up 20% of your body's energy and calories. It's an energy hog. Out of all the different organs, it hogs the most energy. And out of all the organs, it is the fattiest tissue. 60% of the brain is composed of fat, which is interesting. Now, one important thing you need to know about attention, okay, is that it takes a lot of energy in the brain to hold your attention because it's not just holding your attention, it's filtering out distractions and uh, sensory stimulus, things like that. And so if your brain is tired, okay, uh, you're not going to be able to filter out things as much. You're not going to be able to concentrate for a long period of time. So I think a big part of uh, this problem relates to energy in the brain. You've probably been taught that the brain only runs on glucose. And this is a total lie because you can run your body on ketones. In fact, you can run your body on 75% ketones with only 25% glucose. And that 25% can come from fat, protein, or even ketones. In other words, you don't need any carbohydrates or glucose for that 25% energy. So running your brain on ketones can instantly give you a tremendous amount of energy. And on top of that, ketones are more efficient. And the way to feed your brain ketones is to just lower your carbohydrates. And then your body will start oxidizing fat. And then from that, you'll get ketones. And ketones release less waste in the brain. So it's a cleaner, more efficient fuel source. Now, since we're on the topic of attention and cognitive function, we have to talk about this. I mean, if you are consuming gluten, for example, that's going to affect the gut and that's going to affect your brain. You're not going to be able to think. You're going to be in a constant state of brain fog like I was for decades. It wasn't until I gave up the grains 
and went on the ketogenic diet, I felt like a helmet came off my head. I could finally focus. I can finally think. I could hold my attention. So getting rid of the grains on the diet is going to be important. And other things that could be an allergy, like casein, you can have an allergy that can also affect the brain. A lack of sleep is another big factor. Too much caffeine can affect the brain. All of the nutrients, okay, there's several nutrients that are vital for brain energy and to counter this lack of attention. And the biggest one is vitamin B1. If you don't have enough B1, okay, you are going to be in a constant state of restlessness. Uh, you're not going to have uh, this calmness. Um, you're going to have maybe restless leg syndrome. You're going to have hyperactivity, especially if you're a child, and you're definitely not going to be able to uh, think that well but it's gonna be mainly related to the brain's energy. So vitamin B1 is one of the most important uh, vitamins to counter this attention deficit, okay? Uh, nutritional yeast is a good source or find a natural B1. The next most important nutrient is magnesium. Magnesium is necessary to make energy in the brain or ATP. It's also necessary to calm the brain if you have this hyperactivity and you get magnesium from leafy greens. How many kids consume enough vegetables? Well, it's very, very few and far in between. But in one study, over 58% of children that had ADHD actually had a magnesium deficiency, which is quite interesting because if you have a blood deficiency of magnesium, you are very, very deficient. Most of the magnesium is not in the blood. It's inside the cell. And so it will show up as a deficiency in the blood when the cell is severely deficient. And the next most important nutrient deficiency to consider is potassium. If you are deficient in potassium, because of course you're not consuming enough vegetables, because vegetables really give you potassium and magnesium, you're going to have a difficult time filtering out sensory information or sensory overload. That is going to greatly affect your ability to hold your attention. And then the other one is omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids, DHA, EPA, are essential for your nerves to conduct electricity and information. So unfortunately, too many people, including kids, are consuming so much omega-6 fatty acid, soy, corn, canola oil, and not enough of the fish oils like cod liver oil, but that can make a big difference. When you start introducing someone to cod liver oil or fish oils, they're not gonna see a change overnight. You're gonna have to do this over a period of weeks to see the change because it's a slow process. Now there's another really, really good remedy I would recommend as a substitute for Adderall or Ritalin. Now, I'm not telling you to come off your medication. I'm not telling you to substitute. I just wanna give you this as a really good solution to present with your doctor in case you wanna make a switch. Uh, it has virtually no side effects and it's called DMAE, okay? This compound is actually in sardines but I would recommend taking it as a supplement. It does several things, but it can help rid the brain waste that can interfere with your focus. It's very neuroprotective, okay? So it's gonna help protect the brain against inflammation and oxidative stress and free radical damage, but it increases the receptor's ability to absorb acetylcholine, and that's the main neurotransmitter that you need in these pathways it significantly and potently increases focus and enhances concentration. So DMAE is what I would recommend as a supplement of choice if you have ADD or ADHD. Now, you're probably also going to notice you're going to sleep a little bit better and uh, your vision might be a little bit better because it actually gets rid of certain waste that can interfere with your retina, which is an extension of your brain. Okay, number two, get on the ketogenic diet, do intermittent fasting, if you haven't already done that before. And then B1, magnesium, potassium, okay, and omega-3 fatty acids. You can get your magnesium and your potassium from leafy greens in larger quantities. And the next most important video for you to watch would be on how to get started on the healthy version of the ketogenic diet with intermittent fasting. I put that video up right here, check it out.